Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the most exciting event on television, Riot, Righteous Invasion of Truth, presented by the Power Broadcasting Network, Abel Damina is my name. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. Guys, listen, we're going to have an exciting time in the study of God's word. You know, the entrance of his word give it light and it give it understanding to the simple. As you come before the word of God with the simplicity of your heart, ready to be equipped, ready to be empowered, ready to grow and ready to align with the thoughts of God, the plan and the intent of God for your life. Get ready, it's going to be an exciting time together today. Call a friend, call a family member, help me share the video. Let's get the word around the world. You know, as a ministry, there's a mandate of God on our lives to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. That's the mandate that is driving us to get this word to you every opportunity we have. Now listen, I have an instruction clearly to set up a global discipleship academy where I'm able to disciple as many of you as are following our teachings, as many of you as have been Christians but nobody has discipled you. Discipleship is an opportunity where somebody that is being discipled is given an opportunity to learn the fundamentals, the basics, the things that enables you to live out your true realities in Christ so that you're able to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, he said, all power is given to me. And then he said, you go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Discipleship is that opportunity we were able to teach you all the things that Jesus commanded and help you align with the plan, the purpose, and the will of God for your life. We've pushed out the adverts, and I just want you not to be left out. So if you have not been discipled, you want me to disciple you, there's an email on the screen right now. If you shoot an email to that email address, we'll respond to you quickly because we're getting ready to start the classes. It's going to be online. It's global and online. We're going to give you all the details that gets you enlisted into the class. And it's a free discipleship school. You're not paying any fees. Secondly, those of you that are not able to send emails, we have a WhatsApp number from anywhere in the world. If you shoot us a WhatsApp message, we will send you all the info so you can be a part of the discipleship classes. So we're able to disciple you, equip you, empower you to fulfill the plan and the purpose of God for your life. That's how we start 2022. And thirdly, I have just come out with three books of mine and I want to encourage you to get copies of it. This one is Spirit Life. It's powerful material that helps you. Right from Genesis, the work of the Spirit has not ceased to function in and among men. The Spirit hovered over the waters and God spoke. The scriptures are replete with the work of the Spirit. So in this book, you will learn about the leading of the Spirit. You will learn about knowing how the Father leads his children. You will know about the inward witness, impressions of the Holy Spirit. Powerful book. It will change your life. The second book I just wrote is The Gift and Calling of God. There's a call of God on your life. How to locate that gifting and calling, how to steer it up and walk in the fullness of its reality. The third book is How to Win in Life, Walking in Love. The love of God that never fails. This book will equip you to walk above bitterness, strife. It will equip you to walk above all the things that the devil can offer anybody. And it will help you never to give room to the devil. These are three powerful materials that will change your life. Finally, remember I also have a book. It's called The Christocentric Meal. It's a daily devotional. And there are sermon notes that a pastor can preach in his church for three years. They are Christ-centered messages, very sound exegesis. It's called the Christocentric meal. It's on the screen. If you call our office or email our office to order for any of these books or all of it, 
I'm telling your office will get back to you quickly and make sure these materials get to where you are. Don't forget that our mission as a church is to equip and empower you to live out your realities in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. All right, I'm expecting to hear from you today on Discipleship Academy because classes are starting any moment from now. So don't procrastinate, don't delay. Looking forward to hear from you. Now, fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy fellowship. Wisdom for living. Wisdom for living. And we're examining nurturing relationships effectively. Nurturing relationships effectively. Now, the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Next verse. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them, if your Bible was mine, I will underline that. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So he says, make disciples, and we've been establishing this reality, that the word make disciple is the word Matthew. It means make students of all nations. Make disciples of the resurrection in every nation. We also established that the resurrection, therefore, will be studied as an event and also as a person. So, go and make disciples of the resurrection in every nation. That means we are going to learn from the resurrection. We are going to follow the resurrection. And we are going to practice the resurrection of Jesus. I go over it again. That means we are going to learn from the resurrection. We are going to follow the resurrection. And we are going to practice the resurrection of Jesus. Now, please pay attention. We also established that the scriptures there in Matthew 28, 18, there's a way we can rewrite it and rework it. So let's say it like this. All authority in heaven and earth is given me where? In the resurrection. Go therefore and make students, students, disciples to learn and practice in my resurrection in every ethnic group, believers and non-believers in every country, and we can expand it to say in every kind of profession or occupation or social status. Spiritually, both believing and non-believing. So, help me. Look at that text. The word help me there in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 is the Hebrew word ezer. E-Z-E-R. And it's used 21 times. And I want us to read all of it 21 times. Let's begin. Exodus chapter 18 verse 4. And the name of the order was Eliezer. For God of my father said he was mine help. And delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Deuteronomy 33 verse 7. And this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, hear Lord the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people, lest his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou an help to him from his enemies, Ezra. So Ezra is used for when there is danger. It is used for when there is danger. Look at Deuteronomy 33, 26. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help and in his excellency on the sky. Psalms chapter 20 verse 1 and 2. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. 
the name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Verse 2. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. So far, it means to rescue from danger. Help meet one who rescues you from danger. Look at Psalm 33 verse 20. Our soul waited for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 70 verse 5. But I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, make no tarrying. When you see David using it, know what the help is. <laughs> when you see David using it. Now, Psalm 89 verse 19. Then thou speakest in vision to the Holy One and saith, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. Psalm 115 verse 9. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. For he is their help and their shield. Psalm 121 verse 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Next verse. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. Psalm 124 verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth and earth. Psalm 146 verse 5. Happy is he that had the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Look at Isaiah chapter 30 verse 5. We are tracing the use of the word Ezra. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be of an help, nor profit, but a shame and also a reproach. So the word Ezra, help me, it is used for delivering someone out of danger. Look at Ezekiel chapter 12 verse 14. And I will scatter toward every wind all that are about him to help him. And all his bands and I will draw out the sword after them. Daniel chapter 11 verse 34. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Hosea chapter 13 verse 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine hell. So if he says, a help meet, can that refer to a woman? Definitely not. That is a savior. A help need. And when you read Ephesians 5, who is the savior of the body? Who is the savior of the body? Jesus. So Jesus is the help meet for mankind. That is, that scripture is not a scripture to make a woman a house help. So one flesh. That is the relationship which is consummated. By sexual union between a man and a woman. Is a reflection of God's everlasting love for the church. So the resurrection is the marriage. The resurrection is the marriage. The physical relationship is the example or is what follows after. So primarily, the resurrection of Jesus is a relationship, a marital relationship. Look at that Hebrews 13 again. Now, listen carefully. So, when he said, whatever God has joined together, let no man put asunder. You discover that every time that relationship of man is used in marriage, it says that the man joined himself with her. The man joined himself with her. That is, a man and a woman 
get married as an act of their will. The man joined himself with her. So it is not God that joins people together in marriage. It is people that join themselves. But in that joining of themselves, you now reflect God's own joining if you are believers. A man finds a woman, two of them join themselves together in marriage to reflect God's own marriage if both of them are believers. So if a man comes before, whether the altar or the tabernacle or the temple, and claim to be rehearsing some marital vows, let him even do marital vow service, <laughs> you know, and ask people who were married 40 years ago to renew their vows, or 30 years ago to renew their vows. All these are just man-made ceremonies. This vow that we're talking about is God's vow. It's not men's vow. Have you not noticed that when the preacher says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Then they will not add, till death do you part. That means death can part that marriage. But God's own marriage, nothing can part it. Because that's the real deal. <laughs> that cannot be what Jesus is referring to. Because death can do two people part. Even other things, even among themselves, they can do themselves part. Even themselves. Disagreement, lack of compatibility, they start fighting, they start threatening their lives, they go their separate ways. But God's own marriage to the church, no separation. So, it's God's commitment that Jesus was referring to. God's own commitment. That is God's command. Look at that Hebrews 13 verse 4. It will come clear now. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But homongers and adulterers, God will judge. You know, oftentimes, this scripture is used for premarital counseling. They say the marriage bed undefiled. These people are intending to marry. They don't even have mattress. <laughs> they don't even have a mat and you're quoting for the marriage bed undefiled they don't have a bed yet <laughs> so that scripture is not for premarital counseling marriage bed undefiled and some people have gotten married and the couple stayed in different rooms okay so which one is marriage bed? The husband in his room with his bed, the wife is in her room with her bed, and nobody goes to another person's room. So which of them is marriage bed? So again, when a scripture is misinterpreted, a truth is lost. When a scripture is misinterpreted, a major truth is lost. Let's look at that Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 now and do exegesis. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled but homongers and adulterers god will judge now the word marriage there is the word gamos in the greek g-a-m-o-s is used just about five times in new testament greek matthew 22 did you notice that jesus used parables of marriage to explain the resurrection he used parables of marriage. For example, Matthew 22 verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Look at verse 9. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. They went and brought all types of people. Look at Matthew 25 verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Then you see the illustration in the following verses. But then in John chapter 2, Jesus used a wedding to explain his resurrection. John chapter 2 verse 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. 
and the mother of Jesus was there. Give me verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Next verse. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And that word, mine hour, is something Jesus consistently used for his resurrection. Consistently, he used mine hour is not yet come for his death and resurrection. Look at Revelation chapter 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So the work of salvation and our union with Christ is called the marriage. The marriage. So Hebrews 13, therefore, is he talking about regular customary marriage? Hebrews 13 verse 4. Huh? No. No. But can a customary regular marriage take an example from it? Yes. And it says here, the bed undefiled. The word bed here, which is actually used for marriage bed, is the Greek word koite. Koite. K-O-I-T-E. Koite. Let's see how it is used. Luke chapter 11 verse 7. And he, this is a parable of the man who had a friend. The importunity. The parable of the friend who came to his friend at night to ask for loaves. Okay. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. <laughs> my children are with me in bed or in family bed. That's not marriage bed. Look at Romans chapter 9 verse 10. The use of the word koite. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, koite is used here for conception. Used for conception. Look at Romans chapter 13 verse 13. Let us walk honestly. As in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. The word chambering there is the word koite, evil conceptions, used for what you cohabit with or a cohabitation. It can be husband and wife, it can be friendship. So it's not necessarily talking about sexual. It can even be children. All right. So Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 again. Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. But homongers and adulterers, God will judge. Marriage is honorable. This cohabitation is undefiled. Look at the word used here. Undefiled. A word that is used strictly for our relationship with God. Undefiled. The word undefiled here can equally be found in Hebrews 7.26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. The priesthood of Jesus. Look at where it is used again. James chapter 1 verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God. And the father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Look at First Peter chapter 1 verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. 
and that faded not away reserved in heaven for you so he is not referring to customary human marriage this is god's marriage undefiled and god's marriage was done by jesus it is marriage in the resurrection undefiled then he said homongas and adulterers god will judge the greek word here is the word pronos mokios if you are making notes i can spell it for you pornos p-o-r-n-o-u-s pornos mokus m-o-i-c-h-u-s pornos mokus that is homongers or fornicators referring to adulterers god will judge now pay attention to what he is saying if this is human marriage then he will not use the word undefiled neither will the next statement in verse 5 be used if he was talking in context about human marriage look at that hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Wow. Let your conversation be without covetousness. For he has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. So let's view the word homongers used for fornicators and also the word adultery in other texts matthew 12 39 but he answered and said unto them an evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet jonas this was when they came to Jesus with mockery and unbelief. Look at what he told them. He called them evil and adulterous. The word adulterous is another word for unbelieving. Adulterous. Unbelieving. See Matthew 16 verse 4. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. So, to depart from the gospel, to depart from God's marriage, is called adultery. The book of Revelation 2.14, pay attention. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication. Then look at verse 20 of Revelation chapter 2. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols notice that it is related to idol worship the adultery is related to idol worship look at second peter chapter 2 verse 14 having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices cursed children next verse Verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So the practice of seeking after another is called adultery. So there are quite a number of texts like that. So, so the marriage bed here refers to the bed of God's conception. The bed of God's conception. Where the man 
that is born again is birth. Where the born again man is birth. Our fellowship with God. So he says, homongers and adulterers. That is, those that seek for another, God will judge. Those that seek for another. Look at Hebrews 13 verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But homongers and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Next verse. Ah, So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So that is his own marriage. Verse 6 says, the Lord is my helper. That is what help me means. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my Ezra. I will not fear what a man will do to me. So, this is God's marriage. Our physical customary marriages, natural, ethnic, legal, traditional church wedding, all of them are supposed to take an example from God's own marriage. Look at 1 Corinthians now, chapter 6, verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ, Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Verse 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. Next verse. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 18. Flee fornication Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his body. 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Next verse, 20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Which are God's. Look at the way he says it. He shows you the model. One spirit with God. That is the way you should treat your physical body which is God's. So the first thing you need to know is God's marriage. God's marriage is now mirrored in your own relationships. And in this instance, marital. So the one flesh of Genesis 2. Can we confidently say it is one spirit? Yes. So Moses' way of explaining God's marriage to us in the resurrection is to use a physical example. That is the way a man lives father and mother and cleaves. You know? Interestingly, that illustration Moses used is found in Egypt today. In Egypt, it is a man that leaves his father and mother to cleave to his wife. It's an Egyptian practice. And Moses was in Egypt. So it was from Egypt Moses got that illustration. Now in Nigeria, it is a woman that leaves. A woman leaves her parents to join her husband. You know, it's a woman that leaves father and mother. I don't know about other countries. I don't know about other countries, you know. Uh, he simply used a custom of marriage. No matter how imperfect it was to explain what happens in salvation. He used a physical customary marriage to explain what happens in salvation. That God now cleaves to us and we are one with him. That we and God, by virtue of the resurrection, are married in an inseparable union. 
in an inseparable union that shall a man live father and mother is a custom of Egypt because Israel had stayed long in Egypt. So Moses said, you see the way people live and cleave? That is how God cleaves to us. That's what Moses was communicating. He becomes our help meet, our Ezra. So that union is the union. We said that resurrection is relationship of a marriage. Where God in Christ is our helper. He is the savior of the body. Hey, he washed us by the word. He cleanses us. And more than that, he cleaves to us and doesn't depart. Glory to God. He cleaves to us and doesn't depart. That's the marriage. So a key element of this supernatural relationship, which is called salvation, is the resurrection of Jesus. And it is the author of it that keeps it till the very end. You didn't hear that. It's the author of it that keeps it till the very end. Yeah. Uh, it means that the resurrection teaches us to keep relationships. The resurrection of Jesus, the same way he cleaves to us and never leaves us, is a lesson for us to learn how to keep relationships. So the resurrection teaches us to keep relationships. You cannot find departing. There's no departing in God except from the world. You can't find departing as a culture of the gospel. So in the gospel, is a culture of abiding. In the gospel, is a culture of abiding. God shows us the example. You know, they asked Jesus a question about a Jewish custom that some centuries or countries used today. I think we have such cultures in Nigeria where a man dies, they give his wife to his brother. A lot of cultures in Nigeria use that. And then they ask Jesus a question. She married up to the seventh brother and she has no child for anyone. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? For all the seven brothers had her. Look at that, Matthew twenty-two twenty-seven. And last of all, the woman died also. Next verse. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. That is, Moses gave that illustration to show you that in the marriage of God, there is eternal life. That's why Moses used the illustration of she married the second brother, married the third brother, married the fourth brother, married the fifth, because he is trying to communicate that in God's marriage, there is no separation. So he used the illustration of how she kept marrying everybody in the house. That should have taken some years than just terminating after her husband died. Moses was using that illustration to show that there is eternal life in Jesus. That God's life does not end. It's an instruction to show a sustenance of God's marriage. That is, God's marriage, nothing will stop it. That is why he said to God that God's marriage is eternal. That is why when the man dies, the other brother will take over. And the other brother, he is not asking you to keep marrying people's brother's wives. Or keep marrying your brother's wife when he dies. Moses gave that because of the hardness of their heart. Showing you an example of God's marriage to us. That nothing can separate us. Nothing. Brother Paul will write it better. In Romans chapter 8, brother Paul will say, nothing will separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. That is the marriage in the resurrection. Whether life or death, principalities or powers, things present, things to come, 
nakedness, peril, sword. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. The interesting thing is that people have read what Jesus said in Matthew 19 to talk against polygamy. But that's not what he was talking about. He was saying God does not depart. God does not depart. That when God has found in a man a relationship based on the sacrifice of his son, nothing can shake it. That when God has found in a man a relationship that is predicated on the sacrifice of his son, nothing can shake it. He keeps that relationship unto the end. And if that is an example unto us, it means that we were found in the resurrection of Jesus. An example of relationships. So in the resurrection, we have a marriage. Jesus marries us. And he marries us eternally. He told Hosea, he said, even though you have gone after idols, I remain your husband forever. Hosea, even though you have gone after idols, I remain your husband forever. And he used Hosea to do a parable to show that even after you have gone astray, he remains committed to you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. In the Greek, it's like, I will never, ever, never, ever, ever, never. I can never forsake you under any condition. <laughs> That's the way the Greek puts it. I can never. Have you ever seen somebody who pursues a woman to marry? He goes after her with everything. And he wants to marry her no matter what. That is what God did for us in Christ. He came after us with everything he has. So we have learned Christ and in Christ we have learned to never depart. What else has the resurrection birth? The resurrection shows us the example of a neighbor. The example of a neighbor in Luke chapter 10. In resurrection we are made good partners. We are made good associates. In the resurrection, we are made good spouses. We are also made good neighbors. Look at Luke chapter 10 verse 29. Pay attention. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus becomes our neighbor by resurrection. Look at that Luke chapter 10 verse 30 now. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Next verse. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Next verse. And likewise a Levite when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Next verse. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Next verse. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Next verse. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pens and gave them to the host. And said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Next verse. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. Next verse. And he said, he that had showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise so jesus has become our neighbor anyone that you are in a position to show compassion to spend your money to go and help he said that is your neighbor anybody that you're in position to show compassion to jesus said that person is your neighbor i thought my neighbor are those living in my estate 
when you walk on the road, somebody unrelated to you, not in the same class with you, who may never come back to you and say thank you. He said, that is your neighbor. <laughs> so in Matthew 22, explaining the work of redemption, look at verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Next verse. This is the first and great commandment. Next verse. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Next verse. On these two, on these two, hang all the law and the prophets. You know why I said on these two? Because you cannot have one without the other. The second is like unto it. So who is your neighbor? Thou shalt love anyone needing compassion as yourself. Anyone needing compassion. Christ suffered for us and has taught us how to be neighbors. He said upon these two hang all the Old Testament. What are the two? Number one, faith in God. Number two, loving others. Number one, faith in God. Number two, loving others. Look at Romans chapter 15 verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Next verse. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Next verse. For even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. The word neighbor. In the Greek is the word plesion. P-L-E-S-S-I-O-N. Plesion. One that is near you. Look at Matthew 5.43. You have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Next verse. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for those who curse you. Bless those who insult you. Look at Matthew 19.19. 19. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 23, 39. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till he shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So your neighbor is one who is often close by. Look at Romans 13 verse 9, the B part. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So he has taught us to be good neighbors. Look at Galatians 5.14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ephesians 4.25 Wherefore putting away a line, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. So he identifies that neighbor as your brother and sister in Christ. Your neighbor is your brother and sister in Christ today. Look at James chapter 2 verse 23. Oh, glory to God, I love this. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So he has called us in the resurrection to mirror his kind of friendliness. Abraham was called a friend of God. The word friend is the word philo. Someone you are fond of. Someone you like. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. 
Let brotherly love is the word Philadelphia. That's where they got the word Philadelphia from. Brotherly love. Brotherly friendship. Philadelphia. Philo and Delpha. Brotherly love. Brotherly friendship. Let it continue. So we have learned from Christ to be good partners. We have learned from Christ to be good neighbors. We have learned from Christ we should look more to be good friends. Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. And how do you express it? In honor, preferring one another. First Peter 1, 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfailing love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Love of the brethren. Philadelphia. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. That is not to be friendly. It's not a Christian virtue. For you not to be friendly is not a Christian virtue. The resurrection has taught us to be friendly. Jesus Christ is your friend and he has shown you friendly love. In other words, you be friendly. A good neighbor, a good partner, a good spouse, for he has said, the resurrection of Jesus has made us good disciples in relationship. In marriage, in friendship, in partnering. It has made us good, good friends. We will see employer, employee, because we must mirror Christ in all of these relationships. We will explore communication, fellowship. We will explore things that are taught in scripture because we are born of God. So the word of God begins to shape you. You put aside your culture. You put aside your background. You put aside the way you were brought up in your family. Your class has changed. You are now found in the class of Jesus. You are now a member of the ecclesia of God. The word of God now shapes you. Whenever you see things in your culture, Ibo, Yoruba, Kurama, Ibibio, Hausa, Efik, that is contrary to Christ, you drop it. Even if that is your culture that you brought up, once it contradicts the gospel, you drop it. And say to yourself, I have not so learned Christ. I won't do this. Never let the world disciple you. You go into all nations and disciple them. Go into all nations and disciple them in the resurrection. Don't let your culture, don't let the world, don't let the system under which you were brought up disciple you. No. You'll be discipled by the word of God and you now take that discipleship you got from the word of God, go to the nations of the earth and disciple men, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. I will not be with you I am with you always till the end of the age. Hallelujah. Seated together with him in the heavenlies. Amen. We disciple men. We disciple the world. And we disciple the world with the culture of the word of God. We disciple them in his resurrection. Let me close with the scripture. Ayabadaga. The book of Ephesians. 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 Chapter 2 verse number 4. But God who is rich in mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us. Next verse. Even when we were dead in sins. Had quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Next verse. And had raised us up together. And made us sit 
together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Quickened us together. Raised us up together. Made us sit together. That where I am, there you may be also. Quickened together. Raised together. Made to sit together. Today where he is, we are. We are in the Father's house. Where is the Father's house? In the resurrection. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Stand on your feet. That's all I got for you. Glory. Amen. Father, we pray for everybody under the sound of my voice. In this service right here in the house centers, on TV, on radio, on social media, and everyone in our campuses all over the world, that this revelation grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. Barriers terminated, obstacles taken out of the way. In the name of Jesus. Great grace is upon you. Great grace is upon you. And I decree that by the word of God, you are being discipled and you go to all nations and disciple them. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Thank you for great grace upon your people. Thank you, Lord, that barriers are totally taken out of the way. Sick bodies be healed. Be healed. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Glory! Amen! Woo! Amen, I tell you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I believe you've been affected and impacted by the word of God. Now, I decree and I declare that the word you receive today, revelation knowledge keeps increasing in your heart. You will walk in these realities and you will live an overcomer's life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now remember, there's the Global Discipleship Academy and registration is going on right now. It's a free online academy where I equip you and train you on the basics, the fundamentals that helps you to live out the riches of redemption. If you have never been discipled before, even if you're in a church somewhere, you've never been discipled before, you've been a Christian, nobody has discipled you before. Oh my goodness, this is your opportunity. You know, discipleship doesn't mean you're a new Christian. It just means that we're able to take you through certain rudiments that also empowers you to disciple other people in the knowledge of Christ. Second Timothy 2 to Paul says to Timothy, the things you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall in turn commit to others. So if you want to join the academy today, don't procrastinate. There's an email address on the screen. You can shoot an email to us right now. And also, there's a WhatsApp number. You can shoot a WhatsApp request, and we're willing to quickly make sure you are enlisted in the Global Discipleship Academy. It's an opportunity you don't want to miss at all. Tell other people about it, because this is very, very critical and crucial, because the foundation of your Christian life is very critical. It determines everything that you do as a child of God. Secondly, my books are available. I want to encourage you to order for them. There's a phone number and there's an email. These are my new books, How to Win in Life, Walking in Love. The second one is The Gifts and Calling of God. The third one is Spirit Life. These are new. They just came out. They will empower and equip you to walk in victory. Also, there's a Christocentric meal, our daily devotional material. And you can also use it as a pastor for sermon notes in your church for three good years without repeating any message. It's a tool that empowers and equips you to fulfill your ministry effectively. We love you guys. Always a joy to serve you the grace of God. Till I come back to you again on this same platform, enjoy the grace of God and be blessed. Amen.